forget what you know about traditional pyramids. These bad boys have a unique design and a story to tell. Ever wondered about those cool pyramids in Sudan that aren't getting as much fame as their Egyptian cousins? Get ready for a journey through time, a touch of grave robbing drama, and a peek into the afterlife antics of ancient Nubian royalty. Buckle up, history buffs and adventure seekers. It's pyramid time. Nestled along the banks of the Nile River in eastern Sudan, the Nubian Pyramids of Mero, a collection of nearly 200 ancient structures, stand as silent guardians of a millennium-long history, serving as the sacred tombs for the kings and queens of the Meroitic Kingdom. These pyramids reflect the grandeur of the Kushit rulers, often referred to as the Black Pharaohs. The reign of the five Kushit pharaohs extended from Nubia to the Mediterranean Sea, ruling over Egypt between 760 BC and 650 BC. Located within the Nile Valley of Nubia, the Sudanese pyramids, built between 2700 and 2300 years ago, predate their more renowned counterparts in Egypt. Constructed of granite and sandstone, these pyramids boast decorative elements influenced by the cultures of Pharaonic Egypt, Greece, and Rome. Remarkably, Sudan is home to approximately 2,000 Kushit pyramids in Upper Sudan, dwarfing the 200 Egyptian pyramids in number. The significance of the Nubian pyramids goes beyond their sheer quantity, offering a glimpse into the interconnectedness of African civilizations, reflecting bilateral trade, the movement of people, and the exchange of knowledge. The pyramids tell a story of cultural richness and diversity, from the early centralized state of Kerma, with its indigenous architecture to the Napata and Mero kingdoms influenced by ancient Egypt. The Nubian pyramids encapsulate a complex narrative of cultural exchange, competition and shared history. The three initial pyramid sites near Napata in Lower Nubia highlight the prominence of warrior queens with 14 pyramids dedicated to their renowned stature. Subsequently, the royal burial grounds expanded to Nuri, hosting the resting places of 21 kings and 52 queens and princes, including the impressive pyramid of the Napatan king Tahaka, a member of the 25th dynasty. Mero, the most extensive Nubian pyramid site, stands as a testament to the grandeur of over 40 queens and kings. The tomb walls vividly depict mummified royals adorned with jewelry, while their burial chambers contain an array of artifacts, pointing to the flourishing relationships and trade ties with Egyptian and Greek civilizations. Now, let's embark on a captivating exploration into the unparalleled design of the Nubian pyramids. The pyramids of Mero range in height from 6 to 30 meters, rising from fairly narrow footprints, which creates the distinctive steep slopes to these structures. These steep slopes are due to building by Shedef, a simple people-powered wooden crane. It was anchored in the middle of the plot, as the pyramid was built up around it. Like ancient Egyptians, the occupants would design and build their own pyramids in life, so there would be no delay in their journey to the afterlife. Construction could take over a year for the larger pyramids. Unlike the Giza pyramids in Egypt, Nubian pyramids have no burial chambers inside. The outer layers of sandstone blocks encase an internal filling of rubble and dirt, and in one recorded case, the remains of a shadow. Here early explorers found offerings of bows, horse harnesses, wooden boxes, pottery, and imported goods from Mero's far-reaching trade with Egypt, Rome, Greece, India, and China. The south wall depicts the occupant's life as a king. The smaller scenes before them likely depict parts of the funeral process, 
as offerings of cattle were a common practice. The north wall depicts the same king being embraced by the goddess Isis, as she was thought to help the dead when they entered the afterlife. But this is not the room where they were laid to rest. A buried staircase descends beneath the pyramid, landing in front of the entrance to a tomb. Beyond were typically one or two intricately decorated chambers, whose purpose was to help preserve the occupant's spirit in the afterlife. In the first room, or antechamber, you'd find columns of hieroglyphics and brightly coloured paintings of gods, such as Isis and Osiris. The Kushites and Egyptians had intermingled for thousands of years at this point, and shared many gods. The second chamber would have similar decorations. Nikis in the walls may have held sculptures. This is where the king or queen would be laid to rest on a wooden bed. However, modern archaeological digs have never found any remains. No royal remains have ever been found likely stolen by ancient grave robbers, so we can't absolutely know if they were mummified. But associated items have been found, surgical tools, canopic jars, precious incense and oils. Here kings and queens were entombed in death, but what about their stories in life? King Akamani I played a pivotal role in the evolution of the Kushite civilization, particularly in the strategic relocation of the capital from Napata to Mero. This gradual shift, initiated by King Aspelta 320 years prior to Akamani's reign, reached its zenith under his rule when he became the first monarch to find his resting place in Mero. A notable aspect of Akamani's reign involved a challenge to the traditional power dynamics between the king and the high priests of Amun in Napata. Legend has it that these priests could, at any time, command the king to abdicate through a self-imposed demise. However, Akamani, also known as King Ergamenes, according to the ancient Greek historian Diodorus, defied this tradition with determination befitting a king. According to Diodorus, Archimani, possibly influenced by Greek philosophy, led an armed force to the sacred precinct housing the Golden Temple, slaughtered the priests, and dismantled the established tradition. It is crucial to approach Diodorus' account with a measure of skepticism, as it might have been embellished for the sensibilities of his Western audience. Nevertheless, this narrative sheds light on the formidable influence held by the priesthood in Napata. Akamani's reign also witnessed a deliberate divergence from Egyptian cultural influences in Maru. Instead, he championed a resurgence of Kushite identity across various facets of life, including art, politics, rituals and architecture. Notably, his pyramid marked a departure from Egyptian conventions, being the first built in the distinctive Nubian style. The true intricacies of Archimanes' era, including his purported involvement in creating the Meroitic language, remain shrouded in the mysteries of history. Deciphering the Meroitic language holds the potential to unveil further nuances and realities of this transformative period in Kushite history. Archimani II, also known interchangeably as Archimani or Ergamenes II, appears to be a monarch whose name echoes that of his forebear, Archimani I. Despite the uncertainty surrounding their familial connection, owing to gaps in our understanding of the Kushite royal lineage and succession order, Archimani II stands in stark contrast to his namesake. His reign reflects a marked shift in cultural inclinations, with a notable effort to reintegrate elements of Egyptian culture into the fabric of Kushite society. One of the most tangible expressions of this cultural renaissance is observed in the architectural landscape of Akamani. 
the Seconds Era. Unlike Akamani the first, who sought to distinguish Kushite culture, Akamani the second embraced a shared Kushite Egyptian architectural style reminiscent of periods preceding his predecessor. This stylistic revival is particularly evident in the design of Akamani, the second's pyramid which resonates more with traditional Egyptian aesthetic. The influence of Akamani, the second's reign extended beyond Kushite borders, notably in the construction of monuments and temples in Nubia, close to the territories of ancient Egypt. Inscriptions on these structures reveal his contribution to the building of temples at Philae and Kalabshay. A noteworthy collaboration with Pharaoh Pelemi, the fourth of Egypt, is recorded in the construction of the Temple of Dakka. Although these temples now reside within the boundaries of modern-day Egypt, they are still designated as Nubian temples due to their construction in a style that would have resonated with the Nubian population that once inhabited the region. Akamani, the second's legacy is marked by his deliberate efforts to foster a cultural synthesis, blending elements of both Kushite and Egyptian traditions. The temples and monuments erected under his rule serve as enduring testaments to this harmonious interplay of cultures along the Nile. Queen Amenishakato emerges from the annals of history as an indomitable figure, immortalized in the vibrant depictions adorning the walls of her offering chapel. In these portrayals, she stands as a formidable warrior wielding a bow and arrows, projecting an image of power, beauty and opulence that continues to resonate through time. The grandeur of her larger-than-life figure serves as a testament to her regal authority. Amanishekato, like several of her illustrious predecessors, held the prestigious merotic titles of Kor and Kandek. The title Kor, denoting ruler or king, was a remarkable departure from traditional gender norms and echoed the authority wielded by male rulers. The concurrent use of Kandek signaled her dual role as both queen and a distinguished female member of royalty, ultimately encapsulating her status as a sovereign queen who autonomously ruled her realm. While historical records offer scant details about the intricacies of her life, Amanisha Kato's name echoes across the monuments of her once thriving kingdom. Notably, ancient Egyptian writings affirm her diplomatic prowess, citing amicable relations with Rome and her dispatching of an ambassador to the great city. Regrettably, the narrative of Queen Amanishakito is marred by the unfortunate events of 1834, when the treasure hunter Giuseppe Ferlini, in his quest for riches, desecrated her pyramid and others throughout Mero. The ornate collection of jewelry that once adorned her burial, a testament to her royal splendor, fell victim to Fellini's greed, leaving a void in the historical record. Despite these challenges, the echoes of Amanishakito's reign endure, resonating through the fragments of her legacy that have withstood the passage of time. Amanator, the daughter of Queen Amanishakito, carved her own formidable legacy as a great builder during a flourishing era in Kushite civilization. The sheer magnitude of construction projects undertaken under her reign, notably the extensive restoration of the Grand Temple dedicated to Amun in Mero, stands as a testament to the thriving prosperity of the Kushite people during this period. Historical accounts suggest that Amanator shared the reins of power with her husband, King Natakamani, as their accomplishments were consistently documented in tandem. However, it is believed that Natakamani met his demise in battle, leaving Amanator to assume sole rulership, guiding the kingdom with grace and competence. Intriguingly, there is speculation that she might be the Candice, referred to as the Queen of the Ethiopians in the Bible. The term Candice is a Latinized rendition of Candake, a Meroitic title denoting a queen or royal woman, which was potentially misconstrued as the queen's name in biblical records. The collaborative reign of Amanator and Natakamani ushered in an era of unprecedented prosperity, 
the landscape of Mero bore witness to a multitude of construction endeavours, with temples being erected and dilapidated structures receiving meticulous restoration. Their visionary leadership extended beyond architecture, with the implementation of improved irrigation canals fostering increased agricultural productivity, ensuring ample food for the burgeoning population. Trade, a cornerstone of this thriving period, flourished as evidenced by artefacts discovered in graves from this era. Newly established caravan routes linked Moreau to ancient Arabian civilizations in the East, facilitating the exchange of goods, ideas and cultural influences. The artistic representations of many Meroitic queens, including a Manator, depict them as fierce warriors leading their armies into battle. In a striking tableau within a temple dedicated to Apodemek, the lion-headed god of victory, Amanitor is immortalized wielding her sword triumphantly, symbolizing her conquest over adversaries. The echoes of her reign resound through the ages, reflecting a chapter of prosperity, cultural exchange and military prowess in the annals of Kushit history. The rich tapestry of Meroitic civilization nestled along the banks of the Nile remains shrouded in the veils of history. With much of our understanding drawn from the accounts of ancient Egyptians, Romans, and this historical narrative, though invaluable, carries the weight of inherent biases and potential inaccuracies as it unfolds through the lenses of foreign perspectives. A significant obstacle to unraveling the true essence of Mero lies in the enigmatic Meroitic language expressed through both cursive and hieroglyphic forms. This linguistic code, still elusive to us, guards the indigenous voice of the Kushit people, rendering their own account of events and beliefs beyond our immediate reach. Yet, the torchbearers of knowledge persist in the relentless pursuit of deciphering the Meroitic language, ensuring that one day, the narrative of this ancient civilization will resonate in its authentic voice. Contemporary scholars and linguists engage in the intricate task of unlocking the linguistic nuances embedded in Meroitic inscriptions and texts. As these efforts continue, a future may unfold where Mero, in its own words, articulates the tales of its culture, achievements and challenges. The journey to comprehend the Meroitic language unveils a promising prospect. A day when the mysteries of Mary will cease to be solely mediated by external observers. Instead, the ancient civilization will emerge as the author of its own story, allowing the world to witness its narrative, unfiltered and unalloyed, echoing across the corridors of time. Giuseppe Ferlini, a native of Bologna, Italy, embarked on a tumultuous journey during the early 19th century, driven by a fervent fascination with antiquities and a quest for treasures buried beneath the sands of time. His ventures took him across the Balkans, Greece, and eventually to Egypt, where he served in the National Army during the Sudanese conquest, doubling as a surgeon. The allure of archaeological wonders and the rediscovery of ancient civilizations captivated the imagination of many during this era. Fellini's sojourn in Egypt was not merely an exploration, but a relentless pursuit of gold and precious artifacts. The object of his obsession became Mero, an ancient city nestled on the eastern banks of the Nile in present-day Sudan, once the capital of the Nubian kingdom of Kush, Though less renowned than their Egyptian counterparts, the pyramids of Mero were deemed equally invaluable. In 1834, Fellini, accompanied by Albanian merchant Antonio Stefani, embarked on excavations at Mero. Despite initial disappointments, Fellini turned his attention to the pyramids, orchestrating the destruction of over 40 of these ancient structures with the aid of approximately 500 local laborers armed with pickaxes. The relentless assault on these architectural marvels continued unabated, with the most significant discoveries emerging from the largest pyramid Anna 6. Within its depths lay the tomb of Queen Amani Shakato, who reigned from 10 BC to 1 Ad. 
The bounty included not only her sarcophagus, but also a trove of amulets, jewelry, and funerary artifacts. Amid the plunder, fearing retaliation from the locals, Fellini and Stefani hastily loaded their finds onto camels and fled under the cover of night, making their way up the Nile to Cairo, Fellini's treasure, or rather the remnants of the ravaged pyramids, found their way to various corners of Europe through sales, donations and auctions. While Fellini's actions were not uncommon in an era that lacked the ethical considerations of modern archaeology, he is chiefly remembered today for the destruction wrought upon the pyramids of Mero. Reflecting on his exploits, it is striking to witness actions deemed acceptable in a bygone era, actions that would undoubtedly evoke shock from contemporary historians and archaeologists. Fellini's legacy, tarnished by the irreversible loss of ancient structures, serves as a stark reminder of the evolving ethical standards within the field of archaeology. Today, dear friends, we embarked on a journey into the heart of a sacred and abandoned place, one that resonates with the whispers of ancient civilizations. Our focus was on the Nubian pyramids of Mero in Sudan, where the sands of time cradle the remnants of a kingdom's illustrious past. Good news is this pyramids is an UNESCO World Heritage Site. In 2011, contribute to safeguarding this invaluable archaeological treasure. Thank you for joining us on this expedition into the sands of time. If you found this journey as mesmerizing as we did, don't forget to like, share and subscribe.